Hello, I'd like to thank the organisers for this opportunity to talk about heart failure in the fetus and newborn using some examples we've been studying at Sick Kids. I have no disclosures. This is the growth chart of a patient with a repaired ventricular septal defect where preoperative heart failure resulted from the left to right shunting that is typical of this sort of congenital heart disease. In the setting of high QPQS, poor growth results from poor nutrition due to tachypnea and impaired gut perfusion, as well as increased energy consumption resulting from excessive work of breathing. This dramatic form of growth restriction is most commonly seen in infants with unrepaired congenital heart disease. However, we're increasingly aware that abnormalities of the fetal circulation may also affect prenatal growth and development. This is apparent from this data from the Danish birth registry, showing that most CHD newborns exhibit evidence of fetal growth restriction and reduced head circumference. In a surgical model of hyperplastic left heart syndrome, developed by researchers at the Mouse Imaging Center in Toronto, we have recently shown reductions in the volume of the intermediate zone, the, precur the precursor of the cerebral white matter. Recent studies in human CHD patients have revealed that reductions in fetal brain volume are predictive of neurodevelopmental outcomes. In keeping with the concept that impaired cerebral substrate delivery during early life is the origin of the developmental delays that are common in patients with congenital heart disease. We have explored relationships between fetal circulatory physiology and prenatal growth and development in congenital heart disease using MRI. The 4D flow images on the left show how in the normal human fetus, well oxygenated blood returning from the placenta via the ductus venosus, shown here in red, is preferentially streamed towards the left heart and aortic arch to supply the cerebral and coronary circulations. In the magnetic resonance oximetry image on the right, the high signal returned from the blood in the aorta reflects its higher oxygen saturation compared to the blood in the main pulmonary artery. By contrast, in this fetus with transposition, the four chamber view on the left confirms that streaming has resulted in higher oxygen saturations in the left ventricle than the right. However, as the coronal image on the right confirms, in transposition, this means that it is the lungs and lower body that receive this well oxygenated blood, while the aorta and cerebral circulation are supplied by more deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle. The disruption of normal fetal streaming combined with diminished umbilical blood flow and placental gas exchange results in significant reductions in cerebral oxygen delivery in all major forms of congenital heart disease while cerebral oxygen delivery is correlated with neonatal head circumference. We hypothesized that persistent decrements in cerebral oxygen delivery might be associated with ongoing impairment of infant brain growth in patients with single ventricle heart disease following stage one palliation. To explore this concept, we performed brain and heart MRI at three time points, birth, following neonatal surgery, and at four to six months of age in a cohort of single ventricle patients and compared them with a group of patients undergoing a neonatal arterial switch operation for transposition. As expected, arterial oxygen saturations increased dramatically following the switch, while stage one surgical palliation resulted in progressive arterial desaturation. The degree of post-operative anemia was more marked in patients with transposition than single ventricles, while both populations showed a steady increase in cerebral blood flow. As a result, cere cerebral oxygen delivery increased to a similar degree following surgery in both groups. Transposition patients initially exhibited a marked increase in cerebral venous oxygen saturations following surgery, which began to fall again at the follow-up scan. This resulted in an increase in cerebral oxygen extraction in the setting of transposition whereas infants with single ventricle heart showed rather stable venous saturations, reflecting a gradual decline in cerebral oxygen extraction. And so while patients with transposition showed an increase in cerebral oxygen consumption following complete repair, there was no such increase in patients with single ventricle hearts, which was mirrored by a similar pattern in terms of the poor body and brain growth. 
Measurement of the distribution of flow elsewhere in the circulation revealed that venous return from the superior vena cava increased in both groups, more so in the transposition patients. Pulmonary blood flow was very high in preoperative patients with transposition, but came under control with repair and was similarly maintained in patients following single ventricle palliation. However, the most dramatic divergence was seen in descending aortic flow, which increased markedly in patients with transposition, but declined in those with single ventricle hearts. We therefore conclude that the poor brain and body growth that is typical of infants with palliated single ventricle physiology is more likely to be the result of poor nutrition related to diminished gut perfusion than to cyanosis. This registry data compiled from more than 20 North American congenital cardiac programs confirms that older age at surgery is a risk factor for adverse motor development across a range of cardiac diagnoses in both syndromic and non-syndromic patients. In common with our study, these data raise the intriguing possibility that early cardiac surgery could represent a neuroprotective strategy in patients with congenital heart disease through the prevention of preoperative heart failure and the associated optimization of brain growth. In the last few minutes, I'd like to change tag while maintaining the theme of perinatal heart failure and ask you to consider for a moment whether this extremely preterm infant being kept alive by mechanical ventilation might be more appropriately supported with an approach that more closely resembles fetal physiology. The concept of an artificial placenta has intrigued perinatal researchers for decades and has recently become the subject of renewed interest due to the remarkable progress made by several groups working with fetal sheep using modern neonatal oxygenators. The demonstration of normal fetal sheep growth and development for periods of up to a month have led to tremendous excitement about the potential translation of this technology to extremely preterm human infants, in which high levels of morbidity and mortality have remained similar over recent years. Inspired by this progress, we adopted a miniature pig model, which more closely resembles extremely preterm human infants in terms of body weight. However, our initial experience of using a pumpless ECMO circuit connected to the umbilical vessels was associated with the development of right ventricular failure within a few hours, as seen on these short axis views. We concluded that our approach was imposing abnormal loading conditions on the fetal myocardium, in particular the right ventricle, which is responsible for the perfusion of the placenta and which has previously been shown to be very sensitive to increases in afterload. We have hypothesized that excessive resistance in the circuit results in diminished circuit flow and therefore venous return and cardiac output, which triggers a sympathetic response, ultimately exacerbating the loading problem and resulting in heart failure and high drops. The logical next step was to introduce a pump, which we hoped would reduce circuit resistance, maintain venous return and cardiac output, and result in a more physiologic fetal circulation. The addition of the pump did result in marked improvements in circuit flows. And we experienced a significant increase in the duration of our experiments, which then averaged 48 hours. However, despite the improvement in circuit flows, our animals remained markedly tachycardic. And over the course of several days, we continued to observe a steady increase in the size of the heart with myocardial hypertrophy and pleural effusions. This plot of circuit flows on the pump circuit in which the dotted lines represent physiologic umbilical flow shows that our subjects initially exhibited supraphysiologic circuit flows, which then ultimately settled out at around 30% lower than normal controls. Comparison of a range of circulating parameters in our animals versus in utero reference data reveals higher heart rates and blood pressure in the animals on the system, as well as lower umbilical flow and an increase in umbilical venous pressure generated by the pump. The proposed mechanism of circulatory failure in the pump circuit similarly ends in diminished venous return with sympathetic overdrive and heart failure, this time occurring secondary to elevated post-membrane pressures 
with associated basal constriction in the umbilical cord and ductus venosus. Our next step will therefore be to introduce a resistor in the post-membrane circuit with the aim of inducing a pressure drop between the oxygenator and the umbilical vein. During this presentation, we have seen that heart failure can affect even our smallest patients. While it is hoped that an improved understanding of the relationships between cardiovascular physiology and perinatal growth and development may result in improved outcomes for patients with congenital heart disease and preterm birth. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the funding agencies that have supported our research. I'm especially grateful to the nurses, study coordinators, fellows and students that have made our research possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>